This is that once in a lifetime. night that means it's fam night that is my favorite night of the week uh, i can just tell you this i have been looking forward to this night for a really really long time i've been thinking about this series for a really long time um, i'm just glad that you're here tonight and real quick before we even get started i just want to give a quick shout out to our spectrum interns uh, if you're one of our interns can you just raise your hand real quick so i just want to recognize you guys so just so you guys know uh, many of the designs many of the photos that are being used for the series are actually designed by our spectrum interns um, and it just even with this, our series video, you just watched it. It was awesome. That was designed by our very own Lucius. He was just on stage. And what I love about this is that the, the students, just like you, they are using their gifts for the benefit of this family. Uh, you don't have to wait till you graduate to start using your God-given gifts. You don't have to wait till you graduate to start using your God-given talents. In fact, uh, here at Spectrum, our tagline for this year is the time is now, right? The time is now. One of those things that that affects, I believe, is that the time is now for you to start using your gifts. You don't have to wait till you're in high school. You don't have to wait till you're in college to start using your gifts. I believe that God has given you gifts that he wants you to use for his kingdom. And that's not, not something to be used next year. I don't think he wants you to just wait to use your gifts till next month or next week. I think he wants you to start using your gifts now. So we believe that the time is now. And whether you're, this is your first time in Spectrum tonight, I know we have some, some people here, this is your first time here with us tonight, maybe this is your hundredth time, it doesn't matter how long you've been coming here, I'm just really glad that you chose to be here tonight. Uh, we believe that Spectrum is a family, I say that every week, but I mean it, and no matter how long you've been coming to Spectrum, you are part of our family. Um, and as you've noticed, we're obviously not in the hub tonight. Can we give a shout for that? Like, I think it's nice we get to be at the West Side tonight. Um, with that, you know, it's been a while since we've had a change of pace here at Spectrum. Um, so we just wanted to kind of do something a little bit different tonight. Just as we kick off this series, we just figured, hey, let's kick it out off at the West Side campus. We'll be back in the hub at Osuna campus next week where we normally meet. But just for this week, we wanted to do something different. I hope that's okay with you. Um, but honestly, that's what I love about our Spectrum family. It doesn't matter where we meet, we're still Spectrum. Uh, we've met in the hub. We've actually been meeting in the hub for about two decades now. It's actually been that long. Uh, we can meet in the hub and we're still Spectrum. We can meet in the amphitheater. Uh, we can meet in the Greenbelt at Calvary uh, and we can even meet online. And obviously tonight we're meeting in person here at the Westside campus, but we're also meeting online. So some of our family is joining us online. So can we just give some Spectrum love to our family who's joining us online on Instagram? But tonight, uh, I'm very excited to kick off this brand new series. Uh, I've been thinking about it. I've been dreaming about it for a long time now. Again, this new series called It's Complicated. Uh, over the next seven weeks, I really want to try to tackle uh, probably the most pressing issues that you are facing as students. You know, life, love, sex, dating, relationships, all those things. Uh, we want to talk about that. But this series is not just about romance. We're not just going to talk about dating. Maybe you're in here and just like, well, I don't really want to date right now, so does that, I guess I'm just going to tune out for this. So I, I don't believe you should do that, and here's why. We're going to be looking at a lot of different types of human relationships. Instead of just being seven weeks of, of me just talking to you, just me just talking at you, I really want this to be a conversation. So starting next week, uh, we're going to have Q&A after every message. My beautiful wife, Savannah, and I, along with some other guests and hosts, uh, we're just going to be trying to tackle some of the issues, some of the questions that you have. Um, so with that, you can submit your questions, like they said in the announcements. You can submit your questions on Instagram. You can send them to your leaders. And as well, we're going to have a black box um, outside as well. So again, if, if you have a question, maybe you have that burning question, that, but you just don't really feel like you want to put your name on it yet, that's okay. So what you can do is you can just go out there, write your question down. We won't even know who put it in there, but I want to try and answer those questions that you have. So if you want to put your name on it, great. If you don't want to put your name on it, that's fine. But this series is for you. Please make no mistake. This series is for you, and I really want you to participate in this conversation. I don't want this to just be a series where, where I talk at you for, 
for seven weeks. But without a doubt, relationships may be one of the most important factors, the most important things about human existence. And I believe that's because God created us to be relational beings. God created us to be relational be beings. And even before sin entered the world, even before death and, and the fall, God said that it is not good for a man to be alone. Now, that happened before the fall. That happened before all the bad things entered creation. God looked at one human and said, it's not good that one human is by himself. Isolation is not a healthy condition for us to live in long term. Doesn't matter if you're more of a people person, you're a little bit more extroverted, that's awesome. For you being in relationships, you like hanging out with people, that's awesome. If you're a little bit more introverted, that's okay. I'm, I'm an introvert at heart. No matter whether you're introverted, you're extroverted, we have been called to live a life of relationships. You can't escape relationships. You can't escape that no matter how hard you try, you will be in some type of relationship. Again, for the next seven weeks, we're not just going to be talking about romantic relationships. That will be our focus. We're also going to be looking at non-romantic relationships. We're going to be looking at friendships. We'll be looking at parent relationships. We'll be looking at relationships even with strangers. So we're looking at a lot of relationships this next few weeks, but we're focusing on romantic relationships, and here's why. I remember what it was like to be in middle school. I remember what it was like to be in high school. Nothing defines the middle school and high school experience more than dating, right? Uh, if you are dating somebody, probably all of your time, all of your attention is going into that person. You're thinking about that relationship. You're thinking about how much you love them, how much you want to hang out with them, how much you want to ask your mom for money to take them on a date because you don't have a job. Um, or maybe if you aren't dating some, someone, which th that was my, most of my high school experience. I didn't, um, wasn't dating a lot of people in high school. <laughs> Uh, but you're thinking about that future relationship. You're thinking about that relationship that you want, or maybe you're single now, but you're looking back at that relationship that you had that didn't end very well. Either way, you're thinking about a relationship. And it's safe to say that one of the most important things about this season of life that you're in is dating, is romance. And deep down, each of us, each of us, no matter who you are, each of us wants to be loved. We want to be loved. We crave to be Love. So if you're taking notes, here's what I'm calling my talk tonight. I'm calling it, I want love. I want love. If you brought your Bibles with you, uh, and I, I hope you did, uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew tonight. We'll be in chapter 22. We were in Gospel of Matthew last week, chapter 14. We're in uh, chapter 22 this week. Um, and if, if you're still new to reading the Bible, that's okay. I just want to let you know you're welcome here. It's totally cool if this Bible thing is kind of weird. It's a little bit new to you. Uh, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, so it's very easy to find. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the verses on screen for you as well, so don't worry. We'll be looking, like I said, chapter 22 tonight, covering just a few verses, verses 34 through 40. I'll be reading out of the New International Version. That's my favorite translation, uh, but whatever translation you have is just fine. Uh, but before we read our text tonight, before we really dive into this conversation over the next several weeks about dating, about romance, I believe that there's something we need to talk about first. And before we can talk about what I would call our horizontal relationships, the, the relationships with those around us, I believe we need to talk about what I would call a vertical relationship. And that's the relationship with our creator. We have to start there. Uh, A.W. Tozer, so he's this guy, I don't know if you've heard of him, he's a famous Bible teacher, uh, famous just, uh, he wrote a lot of books that we still read today. Here's what he says. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. If that's the case, I, I do believe that it is. Before we can talk about how we have a relationship with those around us, we need to talk about how we can have a relationship with God. That's where we have to start. And with that in mind, let's read our text tonight, again, starting in verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that we get to gather 
Uh, just it's something that we can even so easily take for granted in this day and age, just even being able to gather together in person. We thank you for that. Um, I thank you for everyone in this room. I thank you for everyone joining us online. I thank you that you made us a family. It doesn't matter where we meet. You're with us. That's the beauty of your church. It doesn't matter where we go, how separate we are, God, your spirit is with us. Uh, your church is a people, not a building. I thank you for that, God, and I thank you for this word that we're going to hear, God, I believe that you're going to speak to us tonight. So just give us an open heart to receive what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So here's my first point tonight. It's a framework, not a formula. It's a framework, not formula. So if it's all right with you, can I, can I blow your minds for a second? Is that, is that all right? Is that okay with you? Not? If that's okay? Cool. All right. Hear me out. The Bible does not say anything about dating. The Bible doesn't say anything about how to date in the 21st century. And I know that that may surprise you. I know that that may surprise some of you in this room, especially if you're like me, you've grown up here in the church. Uh, I can't tell you how many messages I've heard about what the Bible has to say about dating or how to date God's way or the biblical, you know, the, the 10 steps to date like God wants you to, the biblical way to date, or maybe you've had to read books like I Kiss Dating Goodbye, Here's my opinion, friends. Please feel free to disagree with me. You are allowed to do that. But, but as I study God's word, and I've been doing it for a while, I do not see anything that tells us how we're supposed to date. I don't. Here's why. The biblical authors lived between 2,000 to 3,500 years ago. The New Testament, as we know, it was completed around 100 AD. The Old Testament was finished. The last book was written about 500 years before that. So our modern concept of dating has only been around, I'd say, about 100 to 150 years. Only about that long, depending on how you look at it. So simply put, the biblical authors would have had no idea what dating looks like in our day and age. Just like our, our modern American political system, our modern American democracy wouldn't really have made sense to people who live with kings and, and emperors. Uh, that wouldn't really made sense to them. Likewise, I don't believe that our modern American view of romance and dating would have made much sense to them either. And if anything, the biblical way to find a spouse you may not like it. It's arranged marriage. That's just how things were done back then. Uh, so, I mean, if we want to be super biblical here, the people who decide who you're going to marry should be your parents. So I can't imagine that that's what you want. Um, I know your parents probably would be okay with that, but I don't think you want to do that. I know I'm glad I didn't. I married who I wanted to. Uh, but sometimes you'll hear sermons about how to date like Isaac and Rebecca. You know, you want to be like Isaac and Rebecca. Oh, you want to date like Ruth. Or, oh, you, you, you need to find a husband like, like Esther found a husband. Let's be real. Let's just be real here. Isaac and Rebecca was, you guessed it, that was an arranged marriage. <laughs> that was an arranged marriage. Ruth was, let's just be honest, it's a weird story. It only really makes sense if you really start to understand Hebrew culture back then. We don't have laws about kinsmen redeemers. We don't ask that if you're interested in a man, you don't go sleep at his feet while he's sitting in a field. That's just a little bit strange. And the worst of them, and I've heard messages on this before, Esther is a way to date. Esther is not a positive example of a healthy relationship because guess what? She was kidnapped. That was not a consensual relationship. She was kidnapped. So please, please, Spectrum, please don't use them as templates for how to date. Please unless you want your parents to pick out who you're supposed to marry. But while the Bible doesn't directly address how to date, the Bible has a lot to say about romance, has a lot to say about sex, has a lot to say about marriage, has a lot to say about relationships. We believe that this book, it's, it's not just some textbook that goes out of relevance when the new edition comes out. We don't believe that. Uh, we don't believe that, that, we actually believe that this book is more than a book. We believe that this is God's word to his people for all times. And, and the truths in this book, they are eternal truths, not just temporary opinions. So our challenge today, our challenge over the next seven weeks is, is not to find out what are the biblical rules for dating, but rather we need to allow God's word to shape the way we think about relationships in general, dating being one of them. How can we take God's eternal truths and how, how do we take those eternal truths that are always applicable and apply them to our modern context? That's our challenge. And instead of looking for a formula for how to date somebody or how to date somebody uh, God's way, I believe that the Bible gives us a framework of how to think about romance, about sexuality, about dating, about marriage, all those things. I believe that the Bible gives us a framework for how to think about it. It's a framework, not a specific 
formula. So what is a framework? So think about it this way. Uh, if you are building a building, uh, if you want that building to last more than 30 seconds, you have to start that building the same way, right? So what you do, you dig a hole, you find out where you're gonna build a building, you dig a hole, you pour a bunch of concrete in it. That's where you start, that's your foundation. You have to have a foundation if you want a building to last. From there, once you have that, you have to start building a frame, right? And that's kind of like the skeletal system of that building, you know, uh, it might be wood, it might be metal, whatever that material may be. You have to have a frame. From that point, you know, you put up sheetrock, you put up walls, you build, roof, you build a roof, you, you paint it. You have to have those things to start off with. Everyone has to start with the foundation. Everyone has to start with the frame for a building. But after that, it is kind of up to you where you go from there. There's a lot of different types of buildings. You have everything from a little shed to all the way to large skyscrapers. Buildings can look very different, but they all start the same way. They start with the same frame. And I think that's how we should be looking at relationships. The Bible may not tell you how to date, but it does tell us a lot about how to have relationships, I believe. So look at me with the first couple verses again. Verse 34, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So this, this story, we're actually picking this story up about halfway through, uh, actually earlier in the chapter. So Jesus had a conversation with another religious faction. And this was another group of Bible teachers in Jesus' day called the Sadducees. They wanted to try and get Jesus to say something dumb so they could arrest him for it. Um, they wanted to get him to say something so they could accuse him of breaking the law. Jesus shuts them down. He wrecks their argument. They go home sad. But then the Pharisees get together, and they're another group of Bible teachers, and they try to get Jesus to do the same thing. And that's what happens. They send this one guy. They want to test Jesus to see if they can see what he believes about the Bible. And more importantly, they're trying to trap him, get him to say something that they can accuse him of breaking God's law. And this one Pharisee, it says he's an expert in the law. He's an expert in God's law. He stands up and asks Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Or I think better translated, what makes a commandment great? What makes a commandment great? As you see, by this point in Israel's history, they had rules for everything. Had rules about what you could do, what you couldn't do. In fact, they had, they had 613 laws in total. 613. And, so, and, they're just, and in Jesus' day, there was constant debate about which laws you're supposed to follow, which ones were more important than the others. And because realistically, you have 613 laws, you can't follow them all. So you need to start kind of dividing, just like, okay, I have a lot of laws. So like, which ones are like, if, if I'm forced into the situation, which ones do I have to follow and which ones are like, can I kind of let slide? So that's what all these scholars, all these, all these religious leaders were debating, which ones are more important to keep. And that is what this Pharisee is asking Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, which commandments do you think are most important? And Jesus' answer to this man leads us to our second point, which is realign our relationships. Realign our relationships. Let me reread verse 37 and verse 37. Jesus replied to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, trust me, you're going to hear me come back to this passage a lot, so just get used to it. Because realistically, this, I believe, is the framework this is going to be the foundation for the rest of the series, how we view all other relationships. We have to start here. And realistically, we, we like to isolate romantic relationships. We like to kind of put it in a category of its own, but I don't think that's what the Bible does. If anything, the Bible focuses on two types of relationships in this passage. One, our relationship with our creator. Two, our relationship with our neighbor, those around us. And guess what? Jesus never actually specifies who our neighbor is. People even ask him, hey, Jesus, who, who is my neighbor? He never really gives us a clear answer. All we can believe, I, I think, is that every human being is our neighbor. Whether you live near them or you don't, every human being is our neighbor. Which means that every human relationship that you can conceive of falls in this category. Yes, obviously, I get it. Romantic relationships, of course, they're in a different category than friendships. They, you know, they, they're a type of friendship, but... That, you know, it's a little bit different. I would hope that, not, that you're not all trying to find a romantic relationship with all of your friends at once. That would be gross and weird. But before that person is your boyfriend or your girlfriend, they are your neighbor. They're your neighbor. 
And you must love them as your neighbor first before you pursue something deeper with them. You think about it, this Pharisee was looking for a formula from Jesus. He wanted Jesus' personal opinion on which commands were were more important to follow, which, which commands could he let slide. He wanted a formula to follow, but rather than giving this man a list of do's and don'ts, rather than giving him his, you know, his full dissertation on, on all the commandments, Jesus gives this man a framework for how to view all human relationships and even, even our relationship with God. And the first step in that framework is that we need to realign, we need to readjust our perspective on relationships. Before we can address our relationship with those around us, we have to address our relationship with the one above us. We have to address our relationship with Jesus. But too often, especially in our world today, we, we've switched the order of these two commandments. You know, instead of prioritizing our relationship with Jesus, we prioritize our relationship with our friends. Or maybe in some situations, you prioritize your relationships with some people, you ignore others, and then you kind of make time for God sometimes. Or even worse, what I've seen is that some people let their relationships with others define their relationship with God. So whatever your friends say about God is what you say about God. Our world is filled, it's filled with with broken hearts, it's filled with broken relationships, it is filled with lonely people. Loneliness is an epidemic in our time. And I, I am neither smart enough nor qualified enough to try and tackle all the reasons for that, but I do believe most of the broken relationships in our life stem from the fact that we have lost our focus on the framework that Jesus has given us here. And now it's time we need to realign our priorities according to what Jesus has said. So some of you may know I'm a watch guy. I have a watch on pretty much every time I walk out my door. I think watches are great. I think everybody should wear them. Um, If you want to talk about watches after Spectrum, I'd love to talk your ear off about them for a few hours. Um, But if you have a watch, or you've ever worn a watch at some point, you'll know that every so often you have to set that watch. So over time, these, these little mechanical machines, they, they either start to, they start to run fast, they start to run slow. So every so often you have to compare what's on your wrist. You have to compare the time your watch shows with a standard. And then depending on what you need to either like set it, you need to like slow it down, speed it up, whatever that might be, you have to reset that watch according to that standard. And like my watch, when it comes to relationships, I believe that some of us, we've been running fast, we've been running slow, but either way, we're not displaying the accurate time. We've lost focus, and we're wondering why why are our dating relationships always so toxic? Why does every time I date this person, it always ends the same way? Or why why are all my friends, why does it feel like it's such a toxic circle of friends to be around? Why why is it even that my relationship with my parents is is toxic? We can't, all we do is we just fight. My friends, our relationships are toxic, they're broken, because we're not building them on the framework that Jesus has given us here. If you are not pursuing a relationship with your creator and your savior, every other relationship that you have will ultimately end up off balance. If you aren't loving God, you'll have a hard time loving others. You can try, but it's never quite going to fit. Jesus tells us that the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. He doesn't say try to love others. If you have time, try to love God too, if you can just fit God into that relationship. He doesn't say, hey, focus on loving, uh, focus on loving others. Just, just love everybody. It's not where he says, and he also doesn't say, hey, the most important kind of love is that you love yourself. And then you just love others with the, the excess love that you have. I don't know. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This verse, it's so deep, we honestly could spend an entire little mini-series just on this verse, but we're not going to do that. Let's make it practical. How do you fix, how do you realign your relationship with God? And I think that this verse communicates actually a couple truths that we can take away, a couple practical steps that we can take to try and realign our relationship with God. So I'd encourage you to write them down. First, we are called to love the Lord your God. Not a God, love the Lord a God, or love the Lord the God. Love the Lord your God. God is not some distant, he's not some uncaring being that's far off. He is your God. He's your creator. He's your savior. He made you. He formed you. He has plans for you. You are not just some accident, my friends. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that. I don't know if you feel like that, but just hear me. You are not an accident. 
God made you. He's given you gifts. He's given you talents that he wants you to use. But beyond that, God is your father. Yes, God is your friend, but he's more than a friend. Yes, God is your creator, but he's more than a creator. He's your father. And your father has adopted you into his family. God wants a personal relationship with you. God doesn't just want to be a God, the God, which he is. He wants to be your God. He wants to be your God. You're not saved because your parents have a personal relationship with God. That's not how you're saved. It's not, you're not saved because your parents are Christians. You are saved because you have a personal, real relationship with God. And if you're here tonight, you don't have that personal relationship, or maybe you've walked away, it's time to fix that. It's time to change that. You can, can pray the same prayer that Peter did that we talked about last week. Three words, Lord, save me. That's all it takes. God wants to forgive your sin. He wants you to experience a life of freedom, freedom from shame, freedom from condemnation, freedom from guilt. He wants you to experience true life. God is your God. He's your father. He's your savior. There is a personal connection here. There's a personal relationship. Other practical takeaway from this verse is that our love, it must be a total love. Again, read this. The love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. God created us to be multidimensional beings, as Pastor Jesse likes to say. Because we're physical beings, right? We have a physical body. We have a physical brain. We can think. We have a mind. We're emotional beings, right? We have a heart. We have emotions. We have feelings. We're emotional creatures. On top of that, we're spiritual beings. God gave us a soul. We're created in the image of God. When this body dies, that's not the end of our story. We have a soul. But love that only touches one part of our existence is not true love. Love that is merely physical is not real love. Love that is merely emotional, it's just feelings, isn't love. Half-hearted love isn't real love. You can't love God half-heartedly. You can't love God part-time. Part-time, you're loving someone else, loving something else. You cannot love God just when you feel like loving God. Hey, I I feel like loving God, you know, 20% of the time. Other percent of the time, I love me. That's not how it works. Loving God is an action that involves every part of your existence. Your love for God must be something that defines your entire life, not just a couple hours here on Thursday, not just a couple hours on the weekend when you come to church, not just a couple hours when you go to small group. Again, Tozer's quote, and I'll share it again, is that what we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let me alter that. Let me say how we love God is the most important thing about us. If your relationship with God is off base, then I can promise you that every other relationship you have will ultimately be off base as well. So if you're wondering why you're surrounded by broken relationships, you look at just how many broken dating relationships you've had, you look at all these friends that you're no longer friends with, start by realigning your relationship with King Jesus. I'm not saying that everything gets fixed right away. Oftentimes it doesn't. But the place to start, you need to realign your relationship with Jesus. Realign your creator with God or realign your relationship with God. That is where we need to start. That's where we need to start. Here's my last point tonight. If you're still taking notes, finding the one won't fix you. Finding the one won't fix you. The band can can head on up back as well. Let me read you the last two verses of this passage. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus says that these two commandments sum up the entire law. He's not giving us some new law, some new rule. He's actually saying, hey, this law that you've been learning about for the last, you know, thousand plus years, this law you've been trying to obey, it all boils down to you love God wholeheartedly and you love your neighbor as yourself. Like I said earlier, you know, looking at people around you, looking at other human beings is whether you just maybe you categorize them as they're hot, they're not hot, dateable, not dateable, I don't know. It's time to start saying each human being, no matter who they are, no matter what they look like, they're your neighbor. If you see your girlfriend or your boyfriend as a neighbor, if you see them as a son or a daughter of God, it's a lot harder to view them as as something to satisfy your sexual pleasure. If you see them, if you see that person as your neighbor, it's going to be a lot harder for you to ask for nudes on Snapchat. Our world, our culture has sold us this false narrative. It's a fake version of what love should look like. 
our culture tells us that love, it's just a feeling, it's just emotions, and those emotions, they can run out. Culture tells us that love, you know, it's... There we go. Whew, cool. Culture tells us that love is just whatever we want it to be. We can make up love however we want. Maybe, maybe just culture tells us that, that we only need to love those who love us back. We only, we only need to return love to people who love us. If they don't love us, we don't have to love them. So many times I hear just like, love is about, it's self-love. You gotta love yourself. You gotta love yourself. Or that ultimately culture, it boils down to that love should be about me. It should be about me. The self-centered love is not true love. It's not. And if your version of love is all about you and your needs and what you want, you're gonna be in trouble. My father-in-law, Clay, told me this when, when uh, many years ago when I, when I went to go ask him if I could date his daughter, Savannah. He told me this. He said, Taylor, love isn't a feeling. Love is a choice. I'll say that again because it's good. It stuck with me for almost 10 years. Love isn't a feeling. Love is a choice. If love is about you, you will always end up brokenhearted because the people you love may not show you that love that you deserve back. So if you're making love about yourself, it's always going to hurt. Love is a decision. It's a decision to love them no matter what. To love them even if they don't love you back. This is what the Bible calls agape love or unconditional love. This is the love that Jesus showed us when he was on the cross for us. When he died for us. That was unconditional love. We did not love him back, yet he still loved us. The point of laying down his life for us. That's unconditional. And we are called to show this same unconditional love to our neighbor. The Greek literally says, agape your neighbor as yourself. Unconditionally love your neighbor as yourself. But because we flip the order of these two commandments, we often look for love from others that we should be looking from God, that only God can provide for us. And hear me, Spectrum, I believe that the reason that so many of you tonight are struggling with dating is because you want your boyfriend or your girlfriend to fix you. You want them to fix you. You think that your significant other will be the savior that you're looking for. That whatever love you're missing, that that, that boy, that girl can provide that. My friends, your boyfriend, your girlfriend cannot bear the burden of fulfilling your soul's desire for love. They can't provide that. Your significant other cannot be your savior. And just as importantly, you are not their savior. You can't save your girlfriend. You can't forgive your boyfriend's sins. You can't offer your significant other peace with God. You can't offer them eternal life. You can't fix them. I don't know how many times I've heard stories that it's like, I, I love them so much, they're really messed up and they keep doing something that's hurting me, but I can fix them. No, you can't. No, you can't. You are their savior. Only Jesus can do those things. You can't be your boyfriend's savior. Stop trying to be your girlfriend's Messiah. That's Jesus's job. Stop making them bear the burden of trying to be your savior too. Because it's not their job to fix you. They can't give you the love that you're so desperately searching for. They're your neighbor, not your savior. Friends, the story of humanity is the story of loving the wrong things. My life is filled with brokenness because I have loved the wrong things or I've loved the right things in the wrong order. I can guarantee you it is the same in your life. I cannot fix your broken heart. I can't. I can't say the right words. I can't fix the brokenness that, that's in your life. But I know a savior who can. Dating that boy, dating that girl, doesn't matter how much you love them, doesn't matter how much you like them, dating them is not going to heal the pain in your heart. It's not. But Jesus will. So before any of us take one more step, before any of us take one more step out that door tonight, Let's take a moment, let's stop, let's realign our hearts, let's realign our focus. God first, neighbor second. And when we build off of that framework, that's when we start to find healing. That's when we can start to find healthy relationships. There are many relationships in our lives that are broken. There are many that, that hurt, that have caused us pain. But because of Jesus, because of his good news, there is hope for the relationships in your life. I don't know what kind of broken relationships are in your past. I don't know, but I do believe there's hope. That's the good news. There's hope. Our God's a God of resurrection. I don't know what's happened in your past, but if God can resurrect someone from the dead, I think he can resurrect some of those relationships. I don't know what, what pain you've experienced, but what I do know in this take this away 
from tonight's spectrum, whatever sin has broken, whatever, whatever hurt has been done to you, whatever maybe you've hurt others, whatever sin has broken and destroyed, I promise you, I promise you, Jesus can put it back together. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for your love for us, that you've given us this framework. God, you have a heart for healing. You have a heart for restoration, for reconciliation, for resurrection, God. So God, I know that, that in front of me that there are so many lives who are just covered in broken relationships, that there's just pain, there's hurt, there's trauma. God, I just pray that your spirit of healing would come into this room. Jesus, restore relationships tonight. Reconcile relationships, even in this room. Relationships that need to be resurrected. God, I pray you resurrect them. You'd restore, you'd reconcile, you'd heal, God. And above all, God, just I know there's so much hurt in this room tonight, and I just pray that you would heal hearts tonight, that you'd come for hearts tonight. I don't know what hurt has happened. We're going to talk a lot about hurt, God, and but your word gives us hope. Your word gives us healing, God. So I just pray that you would do a work tonight. We thank you for what you've done for us, Jesus. In your name, amen. Love you, Spatch. Let's worship.